Hello everyone, this is Greg here and welcome to Just A Mean Podcast where we talk about the future of making money on the web. Uh, today we have a really exciting guest, uh, Casey from Ballet Rising joining us and he's here to talk to us about kind of what the future holds for ballet in specifically and how people can monetize that on the web. So welcome Casey. Oh, thanks, Yeah, great to be here. So uh, diving straight into the questions, uh, tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, what has your journey been to to this date? Um, and yeah, keen to hear yeah. what you've got going on. <laughs> it's a, a, a long story, but I'll, I'll try and keep it a little bit shorter for everybody. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so I'm originally from the United States, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, it's my jazz hat. Um, yeah, I started, uh, I started doing ballet when I was about 10 years old. Um, it was a sort of a crazy experience. Um, growing up in a you know place that's way more famous for skiing and cowboys than ballet dancers yeah <laughs> um but yeah i was kind of a shy introverted little kid my mom was like ah oh, why don't you try ballet and i was also but i was somehow very open-minded at the same time as well started it loved it a lot of people were like hey this kid's talented he could go really far um it was also kind of a like we were didn't we didn't have so much money it was you know my mom was a single mom i uh, didn't have a college education so we were pretty broke all the time so traveling for us was always kind of never really much of a possibility suddenly I started getting all these scholarships to attend ballet schools around the world and I, I was like okay wow this could be really interesting so it really got me out of Utah and Salt Lake City which is you know kind of a uh, it's a great state great city want love it but you know it's it's far out there it's not <laughs> it's a lot of mountains and cactuses and uh, which is beautiful, but when you're a ballet dancer, you know, you just feel like, you know, you're you're a million miles away from New York and Paris yeah. and London, and where ballet really thrives. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I started doing really well. I got my first job in New York City uh, with American Ballet Theater, which is one of the top ballet companies around the world. Um, I started dancing everywhere. I joined uh, Pacific Northwest Ballet for a little while, which is a really great up and coming uh, company in Seattle. Um, then later joined the Dutch National Ballet here in Amsterdam, where I'm currently living, um, which is also one of the top ballet companies in the world. I became a principal dancer, which is sort of the, the wow, lead yeah. guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was the dude out there uh, partnering the prima ballerinas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's so, amazing. <laughs> yeah, I had a I had a phenomenal career. I danced with many of the top ballet companies around the world, many of the top prima ballerinas of of all the major companies, uh, you know, I danced in many major opera houses, you know, Moscow, London, Paris, New York, everything, San Francisco. Um, I just had a, a phenomenal career and I loved it. It's ballet has been my life. It's my family. Um, it's, you know, it's my friends, it's my connections. It's just been a wonderful, wonderful experience. And then, um, yeah, about four years ago, I decided it was time to retire. You know, you get to a certain point where you're like, not as flexible, you can't do splits anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> can't quite jump as high as you used to. So all these younger kids that were just recovering faster than I was after a yeah. hard performance, you know, and I was like, okay, time to figure out what I'm gonna do next. So I took a, like, a long time and decided to just take a year off of life and I just went traveling because I just love to travel. Um, and, while I was traveling, I decided, uh, you know, I, I, I've got a skill, you know, I'm, I've been a top ballet dancer for many years and I was traveling to countries like India and, and places and where ballet is really not very well known or, or you wouldn't think that there would be any ballet schools there, but I noticed there was actually quite a few and, and, and the more I looked, I found that there were ballet schools in every country and, and the people there were really starved for for experience for people to come and teach and, and give them some knowledge they wanted to build ballet schools and companies in their countries they just didn't have people that had the experience and the knowledge and everything and like myself as a kid out in the desert of utah they felt very um distant from the mainstream ballet world um, yeah. and they felt very much like they were on the fringe and so it, uh, i i decided to start a project called ballet rising which is all about the um the, the, the rising popularity of ballet around the world in places you wouldn't you would least expect um, and we're just trying to sort of uh, bring people in the community from from the edges in mm. and uh, create a, a, a more uh, a better communication between uh, people on the edges and the people at the center to, to sort of help the, the art form thrive and grow and, and to be more inclusive and, and 
uh, yeah, just help people around the world understand and appreciate art and, and dance. So yeah, that's kind of where I am today. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, yeah, so uh, this po this podcast was kind of born out of a a uh, an initiative called Grant for the Web. Uh, for you, for listeners who don't know, that's a kind of big uh, uh, web monetization fund uh, backed by some really interesting people. But it is kind of based on blockchain technology. So it'd be good to hear how uh, you, a kind of hardcore ballet dancer guy, ended up uh, looking into crypto and kind of getting interested in uh, web monetization. Yeah, um, it's kind of a funny story. <laughs> right about right about the same time I was studying ballet rising, I was retiring from ballet. My um, I had heard of Bitcoin before, and I was always kind of like, okay, I think it was back in like 2013 or 14. You know, you, you hear that it was kind of up and coming. It was this thing, and I, I immediately thought like, all right, you know, if it's gone that far, it must be something. It can't just be magic internet money. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I didn't really get into it until about two thousand until after the, the bull run of 2017. Actually, um, I'd seen a little documentary, and I thought, okay, I've, I've always wanted to dive in and learn about it and see what it was mm. all about. Uh, but just never took the time to do it until um, uh, my brother found a couple of his acquaintances. They were, I guess, trading cryptocurrencies or something. But they were, yeah, they were like, "Oh, you know, give us a little bit of your money, and we'll, we'll, you know, give you a nice return on it." And it turned out to be a total joke. <laughs> we never saw a dime after that. I mean, fortunately, we didn't put very much money into it. Yeah. <laughs> we also kind of went into it thinking, okay, this could be a total bust. So let's, you know, what we, what my brother and I did is like we were, we just basically said, let's really learn about this market, learn about this technology. Mm. And if we need to pull our money out real quick, then we can do it. You know, let's see where this market is going. And, you know, I mean, you know how it goes. It's just one step from there. It's the Bitcoin rabbit hole. And then, you know, for me, it's, it, Bitcoin itself was just really revolutionary and interesting. Even for somebody who has no background in finance or technology, yeah, uh, you, you can look at it and go, wow, you know, that that could be fascinating. And then, of course, you know, you learn about Ethereum and smart contracts and it was just like, boom, <laughs> holy cow, this is a yeah. whole world. So <laughs> I just got really excited about it and I started noticing a lot of different things that I think could be really, really advantageous for the performing arts and, and things just kind of snowballed from there. Um, and then, yeah, so that led into web monetization. Obviously, um, uh, you know, I got into XRP and Ripple. I was kind of interested in what they were doing. Um, and obviously, you learn, you, you hear about Interledger. Okay, what's this Interledger thing? And uh, I think I was, I was filming a, I was teaching down in uh, Brazil, actually, down in Rio de Janeiro. I was filming a little documentary about um, some ballet schools in the favelas who were teaching, who were offering free ballet classes for kids in the favelas. And um, they said, yeah, we're going to be offering a grant for people to experiment with uh, web monetization. And I thought, great. <laughs> you know, they were like, we're looking for all types of content creators and stuff. I said, like, okay, it's time to bring ballet and, and crypto and blockchain uh, together through through Interledger, essentially. Mm. So, um, yeah, I was just gung-ho from day one, interested in, in figuring out how it works and how we can experiment with it and how I can pull the performing arts uh, into the Internet of Value. Yeah. So yeah, you you kind of got that grant uh, as as did we. Um, what what are you kind of planning to do with it? So how does how does that kind of uh, the interledger the grant web monetization fit with ballet? Like how do you see that working, or, or what kind of what what are you doing with the money? I suppose. <laughs> uh, well, what we're doing right now is is basically just monetizing the content that we're creating. So yep. so ballet rising is is very much. Uh, it's a cultural project, you know, it's all about the culture of ballet um, and bringing the culture together and bringing communities together and helping communities understand dance and the importance of dance, blah, 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 blah. Um, and, but we're using technology, we're using this, the grant uh, to, to experiment. So uh, for me, I'm gonna, uh, we're, we're just basically taking the content that we're creating and we're experimenting with, it. okay, how, how, how does it work? Um, and also trying to use it as a, as a tool to educate the performing arts ecosystem, dancers, choreographers, ballet companies, opera companies about the technology and, and the potential that it has to really revolutionize web payments. Uh, and so we're doing that. Um, but then what I ultimately wanna do is take a lot of the research that we're doing and um, we're already starting 
to create. Uh, this is a totally separate project. This will be a technology project yeah. that wants to. So yeah, Valley Rising is a cultural project that uses technology. We're yeah. going to create a technology project for the performing arts uh, culture for culture. Amazing, yeah. And ultimately, what I'd really like to do is, um, and we just started laying the groundwork for it, is to create a streaming platform for performing arts uh, uh, companies and, and artists to to monetize their performances on the web. So um, historically speaking, the performing arts are always the last to, to, to uh, get into technology. You know, it's sort of like we're the antith antithesis of, of technology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're like a 400 year old art form that's changed very little. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that, how people consume our art form has changed very little over the past, you know, 400 years as well, or yeah. how many years, you know. Um, theater is basically is just theater. You know, it, it, being a sports fan as well, my entire life, I looked at how sports uh, uh, teams and, and leagues and just they would how they market themselves and how they use technology, how they reach out to new fan bases. You know, it always yeah. pissed me off the fact that I could get on my phone and watch my favorite football team anywhere in the world. But if I want to watch my favorite ballet company, you've got to get a ticket, get a hotel room and fly to that city. Yeah, uh, yeah. Why? What? Why not? You know? Yeah. yeah. Okay. There are reasons. It's not like people are just being stupid. But I think that the reasons are slowly fading. And now with COVID nineteen, it's just gone. <laughs> Every yeah. play and opera company in the world right now is streaming their their content. Uh, the problem is that they're streaming it all for free, um, which does one thing. It's great because we're finally connecting with fans around the world. You know. So finally, after how many? centuries can a, a fan in say bolivia if they're a big fan of the paris opera ballet now they can get online and they can watch it you know you don't have to fly to paris to paris you know um now you know the problem really is um how are they going to monetize that content you know they can't just keep giving it away for free uh they're all you know most of these opera companies and ballet companies they're in they're in uh, big trouble right now financially because of COVID. Opera houses are closed. You know, yep. just performance is happening, and so that's why we're moving everything into the digital world. But how to pay for it? How to how to monetize it is a big problem. And I've spoken to a lot of directors and artistic uh, choreographers and people, and everyone has sort of these workarounds of how they're doing it, but nobody's happy with it. Um, and so, what I want to do ultimately is create a, a streaming platform that uh, really enables performing arts companies to stream uh, their content and engage with fans around the world and do it in an economically viable way that, uh, that's, that is smooth for them and, and easy for the consumers as well. Something that really brings, uh, brings people together to, to share in the art form. Yeah, I, and I, I'm just kind of following on from that, I, th I think, where in the past maybe you're relying on advertising to generate revenue on existing ones where they're giving it out for free sort of thing. I, for me personally, when I'm in a theater or something, I, I'm kind of in the zone. And then if I get like a, a, a YouTube style ad that just goes, bam, now there's an advert. <laughs> I, I just like, it would just break the whole suspense. Like it's kind of hard enough recreating that uh, intensity, that immersion as it is. And that's probably a problem in itself but then you know coupling it with the existing web models of you know uh adverts that yeah i, I can't imagine that working too well yeah well and the other thing the main thing is there's a couple of streaming platforms that allows uh, there's there's one for broadway and there's another one that's trying to be sort of the, the netflix of of the performing arts okay um but the problem is, is that these are very these are you know you got the subscription problem right there you know <laughs> I've already got a Netflix subscription. I don't have that much money. I'm, you know, I'm, I wish New York Times would would drop their paywall. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know I, I, subscription fatigue is a massive one for me, uh, and you know, so I just really want to sort of figure out how we can get around that. I don't want to have to force people into that subscription. But the biggest thing, and, and this is what I've heard from a lot of artistic directors is that okay finally after hundreds of years we finally said okay streaming is good uh <laughs> but it has to uh lead people from the web into the opera houses 
And so if you have something like a Netflix where it's just, it's content that's up there for everyone to consume uh, and, and binge, how does that coordinate with what they're doing in the opera house? Mm. And how much value does the, does the ballet company get out of that? Probably not, I don't think it's very much. So it, it, all of that content that's on that siloed uh, website doesn't work with everything else. And so what I really wanna do is create a platform that works more like a gallery, like an art gallery, yeah. that has, you know, where the directors can program their digital season and make that coordinate and work with the real season that's happening on the real stage. So it can act sort of like a funnel to eventually bring people into the opera houses. Yeah. Um, and I think there's there's probably a couple applications for uh, web monetization in that, but yeah, it's, it's still still in the research phase. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I imagine, I, I suppose going back to your point about being a sports fan, that, that probably has holds a lot of keys because I imagine in the beginning, these guys were quite resistant. You know, we need fans in the stadium and I wonder how far they've got with it. Like, I mean, putting aside maybe rebroadcasting rights and that sort of stuff, but... Yeah, you know, well, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, no, I mean, you look at any of the revenue from from all of the major sports teams around the world, and only a fraction of their revenue actually comes from ticket sales. Yeah. Same with ballet and opera. You know, whereas sports get a lot of their revenue from the the uh, the streaming rights and the, the television rights and all that stuff, and and sponsors as a result of having yep. built of that rather than just the small number that can fit in the stadium. Ballet is the same, except the, the lost revenue from the ticket sales comes from governments and, and um, government donations and private donations, yeah. which is another whole another area <laughs> that I'm going to work towards in the future. <laughs> Sounds so, so like you've got a, a lot to get on with then. <laughs> yeah, <it's a> lot. <laughs> yeah, well, you want to you wanna go big or go home sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, th I think just wrapping up, like... Uh, you know what, what outside of what we've probably talked about today like what, what is your favorite like non-crypto project or crypto projects outside of you know grant for the web and xrp and stuff yeah geez, i was <laughs> trying to give that some some really good thought there but um like non big non-crypto projects um I think, well, there's most of the projects that I'm, you know, I've, I've been diving deep into this for quite a while now. So yeah, my, mm. my brain is just really in that, that yeah. mode. Um, but there's a lot of really interesting projects that aren't necessarily crypto themselves, like Interledger, you know, uh, yeah. Interledger is not a crypto, it's not even a blockchain, it's just a web protocol, but it works obviously in tandem. So I think there's a lot of really interesting projects like the baseline protocol that, that the Ethereum Enterprise Alliance is working on in coordination with chain link and uh unibright um okay. that, i haven't come across that that sounds uh, what's the premise base link is it called uh baseline yeah. baseline okay they're they want to use um the ethereum mainnet the public uh blockchain as middleware yep um and I, i'm not the one to really get into that too <laughs> i'm a ballet dancer remember <laughs> yeah two, two <laughs> non-tech people I'm here <laughs> I'm reading. it's really cool it's so yeah but, you know, I think um, something else I've been meaning to do a deep dive into is like KID, um, you know, which itself is not a blockchain as well, but it works yeah. in coordination. I think that's a really cool project. Um, and yeah. I'm really, really interested to, to dive into that. Um, so I'm sure I'll think of some other stuff as soon as this interview is done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those, those are some quick things that come to mind. Uh, no, that's great to hear. And uh, yeah, it'll be exciting uh, seeing where you guys go. Um, yeah, so uh, that's it for today uh thanks for tuning in to just a meme where we talk about the future of making money on the web whether that's arts sports random crypto stuff um please do get involved uh give us a like send some comments a review and also please subscribe and check out the next session uh we really want this to be kind of a force for good here and i think people like uh casey here uh show that we can really do some amazing stuff so uh yeah great having you casey and uh, thank you for your time yeah, thanks so much. Great talking to you. Okay, see you. Ciao. Okay.